for Couchbase. Uh, I've been working for Couchbase about three and a half years now. Um, I've actually spent quite a bit of time in Israel uh, working here with our customers and, and partners. Um, I've got two presentations today, uh, one before the break, one after the break. This one will kind of highlight and, and give an overview on some of the considerations of running Couchbase in a production employment. Um, we're going to go through some of the uh, hardware, uh, some of the monitoring considerations, um, and then the, the next presentation after the break will focus much more on the individual sizing consideration, sizing characteristics, um, which is, is a whole discussion all, all of itself. Um, so just a quick agenda, uh, focusing mostly on what it looks like to deploy Couchbase, uh, and then much more time on what it looks like to actually operate and maintain. Um, I think those of you who have worked with Couchbase already, those of you who are, are about to, you'll find that it's very, very easy to get started with, very easy to get up and running with. In fact, very easy to get very good performance um, and, and even get quite a ways into it. Um, the, the deeper and deeper you get, the more load, the more complexity you put. Uh, there are certain various um, considerations, uh, both hardware um, and, and overall best practices uh, that I'm going to try to, to highlight. I won't be able to cover everything. This is kind of meant to give you uh, a, a list of things to think about and to do some further uh, reading and discussion on. Uh, and at the end of the day, it usually becomes pretty specific to your own uh, application and, and use case that you just need to understand fairly well and, and understand what the, the needs are from your, your database layer. Um, so. Uh, to begin, uh, this is the, the very typical, uh, though not exclusively, uh, environment that we're talking about. Uh, a number of users, be they uh, via browsers or mobile clients, coming into uh, a, a load balancer uh, or multiple load balancers, spread out to application servers, uh, which are then interacting with the, the Couchbase nodes in one or more clusters. Um, and this is a, a slide we've been using uh, over and over and over again to highlight the, the fact that traditionally this application server tier has been very well understood. You know how to scale this layer. Uh, you know that if, as you need more connections, as you need to handle more users, you can just add another uh, box, uh, distribute the load, the cost is, is linear, the, the performance is, is the same. Uh, but the database layer traditionally has been a, a single point uh, a monolithic, either MySQL or, or Oracle. Maybe you've sharded it a little bit, but those are then basically two uh, or more monolithic systems that have to handle all of the requests that are coming to them. What we've replaced that layer with now with NoSQL and Couchbase is a data layer that really mirrors the same capabilities of scale out as the application tier uh, has had for, for many years longer. The ability to, to know that the next piece of hardware you're going to add is going to cost the same as the one you added before, and it's going to give you, hopefully, a, a linear scale uh, capability. Um, and that's one of the things you, you've heard today multiple times that Couchbase is particularly good at, at providing. Uh, and it's this layer and what this layer looks like that we're going to talk about uh, to, today. Um, another way of, of looking at this, one, one layer deeper, is your application server, uh, many application servers that have the Couchbase client library, our SDK, uh, available for Java, .NET, C, C++, Perl, Python, Ruby, Node.js. Um, this is a, a, an embedded native library for your, your application, and that connects to one or more of the, the Couchbase servers over this, this red line of a, our cluster management. And the cluster management layer uh, is what provides each and every one of the application servers with awareness of what is what the topology and what the, the database layer looks like. So every one of these application servers, be there three or hundreds or thousands, has a mapping of what this uh, database layer looks like. And I'm not going to go into the, the details of that too specifically. If you've seen some of our previous presentations, we, we describe that much more. But the key point is that the web application servers themselves, our clients, um, are what does all of the load balancing and routing uh, for the requests. They know exactly which node of Couchbase to go to 
which means that we don't need any other components in this layer. There's no head nodes, there's no config nodes, there's no zookeeper nodes, there's no proxy layers. This is literally the only number of servers that you need to run Couchbase uh, and any number of, of application servers. And it's a very powerful architecture both for true linear scalability, uh, no single points of failure, no single points of bottleneck, um, and, and allows us and helps us do a lot of the performance and, and scale that we do so well. Um, so touching a little bit on hardware, I'm going to come back to this. Um, we are designed for commodity hardware. Uh, now, commodity means different things to different people. Uh, as you heard from, from Amir, his SSD instances in, in Amazon with maybe 16 cores are uh, commodity for him. Certainly there are, there are customers out here that have even lower powered Amazon instances. And then we have other customers uh, that are running, uh, and, and this is an actual customer system, a 32 core Fusion IO, one terabyte of RAM uh, machine, and that's their commodity. Uh, so it really depends on your own environment, your own hardware resources, whether you're cloud, whether you're virtualized, whether you're physical, but whatever your commodity is, is what Couchbase has been designed for. Um, and we have certain hardware recommendations. I wouldn't even call them requirements because the requirements come from your own uh, needs, from your application and your data layer's needs. Um, we certainly uh, test and, and have a number of customers deployed in, in Amazon EC2 and other cloud environments. I'd say half of our, a solid half of our customers are deployed in, in Amazon. Our biggest, biggest ones are, are not, other than uh, Viber now, um, but uh, the, certainly one tier below our, let's say our top three or four customers, half of those are, are deployed in Amazon. Um, all of that means we're, we're really designed for scaling out, not scaling up. That doesn't mean that you don't get more power by increasing the capacity and the, the power of your hardware, but that shouldn't be your first approach. You should design yourself to, to scale out, and when you do need more capacity or more throughput or any of the things we're going to talk about, adding another node will give you a much larger benefit than incrementally increasing the power or capacity of the nodes that you currently have. Um, so talking about physical versus virtual, obviously if you're an Amazon, you have very little choice in, in that matter, um, but in, in many uh, data center deployments, we get asked the question, uh, should we deploy on, on physical or, or virtual hardware? Um, there's no argument that physical hardware will give you the best performance and the most efficient usage of resources, uh, but the trade-off of virtuali virtualization, the advantages that come from virtualization are sometimes uh, much more than the, the loss of performance or the loss of, um, uh, of efficiency. And there just tend to be other considerations or other things you want to think about when when using virtualized hardware. We have plenty of customers that do run in virtualized environments. There's no one at Couchbase that will tell you that's not something we support, um, but it's just a different environment than physical hardware, and it's even a different environment than, than Amazon. Um, so we usually talk about uh, these four or five uh, characteristics. You're going to lose some RAM efficiency. Uh, taking a, a 32 gigabyte uh, physical piece of hardware and splitting it up, in, you, you can't even split it up into eight uh, eight, eight gigabyte nodes because each VM has a little bit of overhead, the hypervisor and all of that. So you're going to lose some of that overall RAM capacity. Um, and the disk I.O. is usually not as fast as you can get with uh, physical hardware. Uh, what that all really kind of comes down to is you're probably going to need more virtual nodes than you would otherwise have if it was physical hardware. That may be one extra node, that may be two, that may be a significant amount, um, and that's just part of the, the trade-off of virtualize, virtualizing uh, as opposed to using uh, physical hardware. Uh, make sure that you're not putting more than one Couchbase uh, VM or one Couchbase node uh, on each physical host. That kind of defeats our replication and clustering capabilities. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have other things living on the same host, uh, but you really want each Couchbase node to have its own physical host. Um, but also be careful if you're co-locating Couchbase with other applications that you're not over-committing the RAM or the disk I.O. Or the, or the CPU. Couchbase is a database. It needs its resources and it will take, it will make use of the resources that it's given. Um, if you give it eight gigabytes uh, of, of RAM, but that's overcommitted with 10 other systems, uh, you're going to, to lose some of that speed and, and some of the stability. 
Um, and then as a basic rule of thumb, um, we recommend always three uh, or more nodes. This is for the best distribution, replication, the ability to lose a node and still have uh, not a single point of failure, and at least four gigabytes of RAM, four or more cores. Um, and we talk about and really recommend using local storage as much as possible. Um, not that SANs are not capable of providing performance, but they break our scale out model to some degree. If you have, if you just took your database and you spread it out to, to uh, scale out, and now you're having that all scale back into a monolithic SAN, you've just moved the problem somewhere else. Um, also, if that SAN starts to have problems, it's going to affect every node in your Couchbase cluster, whereas if you're using all local storage, the failure of or a problem with one disk or one uh, set of disks there isn't going to affect the whole, uh, the whole cluster. So these are uh, rule of thumbs. These are guidelines. Uh, these are, to some degree, best practices. We do have customers that break them uh, on, on, on occasion. Um, but if we start to see problems, it's usually these sort of areas that we, uh, that we look at and, and question. Um, if we talk a little bit about deploying in Amazon or, or really cloud environments, and I separate this from virtualized environments, a, a VMware uh, virtualized environment is not really a cloud. Uh, when you really uh, virtualize or abstract all the layers, the hardware, the network, like you have in Amazon, that's really a true cloud. And you can have that a private cloud in your own environment, um, but just running three or four VMware ESX machines and having 10 or 20 uh, application servers on top of them is not really a cloud. That's virtualized, which is, which is fair enough, but cloud has its own uh, considerations because you lose so much control over what's going on underneath. Um, and in Amazon especially, um, using the Elastic IPs or host names, this helps with flexibility because your uh, IP address underneath may change as nodes get rebooted or uh, get swapped out. Um, uh, recommending if you're going to use EBS uh, to go for a RAID 10, um, not for redundancy, but rather for throughput and, and better I.O. You have all of your safety and redundancy built into Couchbase through its replication and, and potential backups, but you want the most throughput to disk possible. Um, this is for, for cross data center replication, you're going to need to use, excuse me, a, a host name. And actually with, uh, with the current version of software, we don't provide any security across the cross data center replication link. With the 2.5 version that's coming out uh, either next week or, or the week after, we will provide SSL security over that cross data center link. Um, so you don't need to set up your own VPN or, uh, or, or SSL there. Um, we talked, I talked about this a little bit. Um, we'll, you'll see tomorrow, um, in the next presentation much more. When you talk about sizing, disk I.O. becomes an important, very important consideration uh, for different reasons. For, for uh, Edo's presentation and live person, they have a fairly write heavy uh, application. And so being able to drain that data to disk is an important part of their disk I.O. considerations. For Amir and, and Viber, while it's more read heavy, they still have a, a significant amount of writes. They're also doing cross data center replication, which is taking from the disk. And so depending again on your application and your requirements, you're going to need different levels of, uh, of disk I.O. Uh, and and that all that also depends on the environment that you're in. If you're on physical hardware, if you're on virtual, if you're on Amazon, if you have access to SSD, if you're only using EBS, all of these are things that you should be thinking about. And there isn't ever going to be one right answer for everybody. And in fact, the right answer for somebody yesterday may change tomorrow. Uh, but these are the areas that you want to, to be thinking about and take into consideration. Um, lastly, in, in Amazon, uh, again, with 2.5 coming, uh, we have, I know Amir was talking about this earlier, uh, zone awareness. We call it rack zone awareness. The ability to group nodes within a cluster so that replication happens between groups but not within groups. That way, if an entire group fails, you have a full copy of the data no matter how many nodes that was elsewhere in another zone or another group. This works very well for Amazon availability zones. This works very well for physical data centers where you have racks uh, of nodes, each with their own uh, top of the rack switch, where you might want to group uh, replicas across racks in case one fails. Um, that's not possible in the current version. Uh, that is a feature that's been added already for, uh, for 2.5. Um, OK, before I get into that, into the next section, any questions uh, up until this point? And I'll probably have a bunch of time at the end to, to take questions. 
that's either a good good sign or a bad sign. Yes, Ophir? Okay, so the question was why would you, why do you prefer to scale out rather than scale up? Because um, it means more nodes for us, obviously. Um, the, the improvement you get, the, the benefit you get from adding, let's say you take, um, take an example, you have five nodes and you're, gonna add a, you're either going to add a sixth or you're going to increase the capacity of each one uh, of those five. Um, well, a better example is let's take three nodes and you're going to either add a fourth uh, or, uh, or increase the capacity of, of those three. Are you going to increase the capacity of each of those three uh, each by a third? or adding one more node gives you a full third more uh, capacity. And if you just have spinning disks going from, let's say, a 10K drive to a 15K drive, is not giving you a third more imp improvement um, in, in overall disk throughput. Um, same things with, with RAM capacity, CPU capacity. You have to, the incremental improvement of, of increasing the capacity of just a few nodes uh, as opposed to adding one more gives you much more benefit. The distribution of load across more nodes uh, means each node needs to handle less and less of, uh, of that load. Now, what we, what we typically see is customers scale out to a certain point and then decide, well, now I have too many nodes and I'd like to shrink that down and scale them up. Um, so uh, a, a practice I've seen, especially in Amazon, is going from start with three nodes, let's call them the M2, four extra large, um, three to five to ten, but now at, at ten nodes I'd rather go into the SSD instances and shrink it back down to five. And that's, that's perfectly reasonable and you can do that with Couchbase through our rebalancing and, and, and always on kind of maintenance. Um, but just going from three nodes of M2, four extra large to three nodes of uh, the SSDs is not going to give you as much of a benefit. So that's the kind of general uh, paradigm. And it's not a, an exclusive answer for, for everything, um, but looking at what kind of resources you can get for the, and the difference between just running three more powerful nodes or uh, adding one more or adding two more is usually going to give you a better benefit. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so let me go back to that. Good question. Um, because each client library, it's a, you know, in, in Java, it's, it's, a, it's a class you load in, and .NET, it's a DLL. It's just how you instantiate the Couchbase object when you say, uh, give me a new Couchbase client or uh, connect to a Couchbase cluster. You're connecting to one of these nodes, but then you're getting the topology information of all of them. Um, and so at no point is there a need for any layer between your client library, your application server, and, and Couchbase. Over the network, requests are sent directly to the nodes that are responsible for receiving them. Um, so you'll never, you'll never make a request to node number one for data that you then have to go get from node number two. Your, your application already knows that the data you want is on node number two. Um, and so this handles all of the load balancing, all of the routing, um, and even as you add or remove servers, I'm not going to show you the, the, the slides here, but as you add or remove servers, this connection is maintained and those, the clients are updated with that. So you still don't ever need to uh, reconfigure your clients to say there's five more servers or there's just one more server. Or when one goes down, that connection is moved over to another server and the topology is maintained. All those sort of things are just uh, very transparent for the application. So you treat Couchbase as a single logical database single logical unit that happens to be spread across any number of nodes. Those nodes could be coming or going, um, and your application logic is just reading and writing uh, to that, that logical unit of the database. Does that make sense? Okay, let me move on, and then I'll have time for more questions at the end. Um, so after we talked about these kind of high-level considerations, let's, let's get into some more of the, the specifics. Um, on the server side, uh, it's it, getting out of the box. Couchbase works very, very uh, immediately. There's very, very little configuration parameters to tune. Um, the more and more load you put on it, the more complexity you add, you'll, you'll find that uh, there are certain tunables that we can apply. Um, there's certain threading that we can add or decrease. Um, but for the most part, you really just want to leave it alone, uh, monitor it, 
if you identify any problems or see any, any uh, source of, of contention, those are things we can remedy. Uh, but we really try to, to advise customers not to go, not to go about over-engineering from the beginning, uh, not to, to pick up all of the different possible things you can tune, um, rather work with it out of the box. If the defaults are not enough, really we need to either change our defaults um, or just slightly modify uh, a few things. But it gets far too complex if you think about all of the different tunables and over-engineering for a load that you haven't even really seen yet. Um, the, the three kind of best practices, um, we always recommend, as I mentioned, three or more nodes um, in, in production. Um, this is so that the data is not only replicated, but also distributed evenly across uh, three systems. If you need to remove one of those, if one of those fails, you're not down at a single point of failure that you would be at uh, with two. And I'll talk about that more in the next section, in the next presentation. Um, we generally recommend you can now separate uh, different disk drives, different paths, partitions uh, for your installation path, for your data storage path, and for your index layer. Uh, that allows you to take advantage of, of many more disk spindles or, or disk drives, uh, each, of which, each of which of these has a slightly different workload characteristic, uh, again, depending on your application. Um, and especially for, for starting out, um, we, we really recommend planning to over-provision the amount of RAM that you're going to need um, <clears throat> and allowing your application to grow into that system, um, or even lowering the quota after the fact, um, but trying to, uh, trying to work with Couchbase when you are expecting some data to be in RAM and you don't really know the working set uh, of your application yet um, is just asking for latency uh, issues and asking for uh, kind of red herring investigations, whereas if you keep everything in RAM to start out with, you'll know what the best performance you can get is and then you can back off from that uh, as your, your application or workload demands. Um, on the client side, uh, just a few uh, best practices. Uh, our client libraries, um, we have a pretty regular cadence of maintenance releases. We release a new one every, uh, I think, the first Tuesday of every month. Um, and so that means they, they move pretty quickly, but each one of those has a relatively small amount of bug fixes. And it's always a good idea to stay uh, up to date with that. Uh, we run into lots of clients who, who say, you know, I'm just starting to test out uh, your software and I'm running on a, a client version that's 10 versions older than the, the latest one. Um, and any problems you're running into are, are likely to have been already fixed. Um, so it's harder to do that in production, uh, but certainly if you're testing or if you're doing new development or uh, just keep an eye on the latest client updates as you go through your, your staging um, and, and test environments. Um, this is, is becoming less and less of a problem, uh, but we've seen a number of cases where uh, the client, the application logic is actually creating too many client objects. Um, and this can put undue load on the application servers and on the cli Couchbase clients, uh, cluster nodes themselves. All of our client libraries are meant to be used uh, in a singleton model uh, where you reuse the same object multiple times from, from multiple threads. Um, and, and rather than the typical, uh, I guess, MySQL uh, architecture of open, a, create a new connection for every request, tear that down, create a new one, tear that down. With Couchbase, you really want to create one connection and then reuse that as much as possible over the lifetime of the JVM or the, or the .NET application or, or whatever uh, your, your framework is. Um, this, this two or three uh, URIs, URLs, allows that the, if the client connects to one of them and that's not available uh, or fails somewhere in the middle, it has another uh, one to, to connect back to. If you think about my example before with four, five, six nodes, you don't need to configure all of them in the client, but if you provide a list of two or three, that means when the client is starting up, if the first one's not available, it will fall over to the next one or the next one after that. Just giving yourself an extra layer of, of high availability. Um, we recommend turning on logging, um, at least at, at info level. Uh, many times if, if we get a support request, the, re the request is, is to turn, or the, the response is to turn on more logging so we can figure out what's going on. It's probably best to have that on by, by default. Uh, doesn't have to be at the, the finest or, or super debug, but some idea that you can see both from the server side what's going on. We have logging enabled there uh, automatically, but also from the client side that you can correlate those two, those two sides of talking to each other. 
Um, and we don't talk too much about Moxie anymore. Um, it's not, uh, hopefully not necessary in, in the vast majority of deployments. This was our uh, proxy process uh, that was used for any legacy client. So Couchbase, with its heritage from Memcached, actually supports the Memcached protocol, and you needed this proxy in the middle to, to translate that from standard Memcached clients to Couchbase. With the, the last year or year and a half worth of our own client SDKs, this gets removed from the picture except for very specific environments. Um, so stay away from it unless you know you have to use it. Okay, um, so let's focus a little bit now on once you've got Couchbase in production, uh, what does it mean to, to operate and, uh, and maintain it? Um, <clears throat> Couchbase does a number of uh, maintenance and, and management tasks itself. Um, all of these, these four are things that we manage ourselves. Uh, cache management, compaction, I'm going to go through them in a minute, um, index updates, and occasionally we want to uh, tune or adjust these. But again, starting off with the defaults um, and then monitoring based upon your own uh, application workload or, or characteristics. Um, so cache management uh, with, with other systems, uh, certainly relational databases, you have to manage sometimes a separate caching layer. Uh, with Couchbase, that's all built in. We do automatic cache ejection uh, of throwing data out of RAM after it's been written to disk and, excuse me, bringing it back up uh, from RAM as requests are made. Um, you want to monitor the, the cache miss ratio and the resident item ratio. So the cache miss ratio is uh, the percentage of your reads that are being serviced from disk through Couchbase, but from disk, as opposed to from RAM. Uh, some of our customers have that at a very, very low uh, baseline. Some of the customers expect that to be a higher number, and that really depends on your, uh, on your application. Um, as Amir was saying, uh, at, at Viber, one of their clusters um, is running at, at 0 0.000003 um, of a cache miss ratio, whereas the next clusters that he deploys, he expects to have a much higher level, and that's just the nature of the, the application and the working set and understanding what that difference is for your application. Um, resident item ratio uh, related is the percentage of data that is cached in RAM from the overall data set. And you can see how these two kind of relate, where you may have all of you, if you have all of your data cached in RAM, you're not going to serve any of it from disk. But if you have even a very small por portion of data cached in RAM, you could still be serving all of your requests from RAM and have a very low cache miss ratio. Or the other way around, if you don't have all of your data cached in RAM, many of your requests could be for that data that's not. And so understanding how those two kind of come together, especially for your application, um, is, is important. And I'll talk about uh, the working set uh, in the next presentation, but that's really the uh, active data for your application. Sometimes that's big, sometimes that's small, sometimes that's a fraction of your overall data set, sometimes that's the entire data set. And keeping that below the high water mark will ensure that it is uh, always kept in RAM. Um, our view and, and index updates, uh, we automatically keep them up to date. Uh, every five seconds, we check if there's been more than 5,000 uh, changes to a, a particular uh, data set, and then we process the, the view uh, and index uh, automatically. Those numbers can be changed based upon your, uh, your application. Um, I, yeah. um, and then disk compaction uh, is another pretty classic um, challenge for databases. Uh, lots of, of other technologies uh, tend to force you to take the database down in order to do compaction. Um, Couchbase doesn't. We manage this all automatically for you. Um, a lot of help comes from our separation of our uh, RAM caching layer versus our disk I.O. layer. So not every request of yours needs to be serviced by the disk every time, like many technologies. And so we are able to do things at the disk, like compaction, like take backups, like index updates, without impacting your performance or availability of the data uh, into and out of RAM. Um, so for those of you not familiar with what disk compaction means, um, we have what's called an append-only file format on disk. And what this means is that every write, every insert, update, or delete uh, is actually a new record written to the end of the disk. And so if we write the first document, document A, write the next one, write the next one, B and C are written to the end of the file uh, in line. If we continue writing to the system and continue updating some data, uh, document A uh, will be written a new record 
well, the old one still stays there on disk. It's invalidated, it will never be accessed, but it's taking up uh, blocks on disk. Uh, same with B, uh, a new document, document D inserted in line, document A again overwriting one before. Neither of these have actually been removed from disk. Now, this gives us lots of advantages in terms of performance to the disk, reliability on the disk. The disadvantage is that the disk file will be continuously growing, and you can see how eventually you would, you would run out of space. Well, this is where compaction comes in, and Couchbase will automatically detect the percentage of data that is no longer useful on disk, and it will uh, rewrite the file with only the latest data. Um, and after compaction, you end up with uh, a, a newly written file missing that, um, those, those empty or those